You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. This season of Island Crime contains material that might be difficult to hear. Sweethearts explores themes of human trafficking, sexually exploited youth, violence, and murder. Please take care while listening. I'm in university at around the time Kim, Sherry, and Melissa are being trafficked as sex workers. I'm studying politics, beginning to cut my teeth on social justice issues. I take a job at a strip club. I lie, telling my parents back home that I have a gig at a nice place where some of my professors hang out. That second part is true. I'm waitressing at the Down on Its Luck Hotel Kent. It's a high Victorian building in downtown Waterloo, Ontario. The dancers have to put money in the jukebox for music to dance on the small stage. They bring their own mats or towels, too. I have this idea that maybe the dancers will become my friends. They appear to be about my age. But that never happens. Thinking back, I try to see myself through their eyes. They are the first women I meet who are working within the commercial sex business. I'm trying to make money to help pay my way through university. This is a temporary stop. They must see me for what I am at that time. A thrill seeker, slumming it. I'm Laura Palmer. And this is Island Crime Season 6, Sweethearts, Episode 3, The Girl in the Polka Dot Tights. I've only ever seen one picture of Melissa Nicholson. She has long, thick, reddish-brown hair. It's parted in the middle and feathered back a style most of us had back then. Melissa has a big, open smile and hazel-colored eyes. She has gorgeous dimples in her sweet face. Another climb, another fall Another try, another call You made your choice to be alone You had the chance to change it all Another moon, another sun You drop your petals one by one You shut the roses with your gun You didn't stay, you chose to run I'm not mad, I'm just sorry I couldn't make you feel safe I will give you space, don't you worry I will learn how to dance in the rain Linda LaFort is Melissa's stepmother. She is a Mohawk woman from Tyendaga, Mohawk territory, on the other side of the country. She's just adorable. She's the most adorable little thing. She has long blondy like it's like different shades of blondish hair and I used to braid it and it, I, I often said that it would look like honey it looked like when you are pouring honey and you see the different colors as it's dropping into the bowl you're putting it in she had big front teeth so when she smiled it was like a big cheesy smile like her whole face lit up because her front teeth were larger her whole face would light up she had like um hazily colored eyes, so just everything was kind of sparkly. She was just, just a joy. Melissa's birth parents are both now deceased. Melissa was Indigenous. Her birth mother, Genevieve, or Jenny, as she's sometimes called, was Indigenous as well. Some of those I speak with believe Jenny was Cree, although I've been unable to confirm her specific Indigenous heritage. I unearth an old news story about Melissa's mom. She's walking the streets of downtown Victoria, desperate for information about her daughter's murder. 
and I'm told Melissa's dad never stopped searching for answers. For years, he carried a briefcase stuffed with information he had collected about Melissa's murder. Today, more than 33 years on, Melissa's surviving loved ones aren't much further ahead in understanding why 17-year-old Melissa was killed. She was just a sweet kid trying to survive. Melissa's childhood isn't easy. After her parents split, she lives with her mom and at times with her father and his new partner, Linda. Melissa at one point lived with us when she wasn't living with us when she was with her mother. We saw her regularly and she'd come and stay with us. She was kind of, um, oh, in that restless, um, I don't know what you call it, like the puberty, you know, puberty set in, kind of a contrary young woman. Um, I just think of her having a pretty chaotic life with lots of people coming and going. So it was nice to have her around and just try to do regular things as much as we could. You know, have a chance to be in the country because we always lived in the country. But it's not those bittersweet memories of Melissa's childhood that occupy Linda's mind after all this time. She is haunted by the last conversation she had with Melissa. It's something that I carry as a horrible guilty feeling. Her dad and I split up. Her dad um, had issues that I couldn't no longer tolerate. It ended up not working out. After her separation, Linda moves home to Ontario. That's where she gets a call from a social worker back in BC. A social worker, I think she said she was a street worker actually, from Victoria, saying that she had Melissa in the office and Melissa was having difficulty staying at home with her mother and she was running away all the time and not attending school and wondered if, as she described me as being like her mom and her little brother and sister and that she wanted to come and live with us. I explained to the social worker that what my struggle was, I, I myself had two little kids. I was running out of unemployment soon. I was trying to find a job and I was just trying to get settled myself. So I wasn't sure it was a good idea for me to bring Melissa into the mix with that, with what I was trying to do myself. Um, but that, you know, I would stay in touch and I wanted to be able to keep a relationship with her and keep in touch with her. So she thanked me for that. And then I spoke to Melissa and I explained to her too what was happening and that I would find work and, you know, I would keep in touch with her. And so she said, okay, I'm going to try harder to stay at school and go back to stay with my mom. And, you know, kind of, that was it. I feel like life could have been so different if I would have said yes then. In an article written after Melissa's death, there are a few sparse details about what is going on in Melissa's life in the years leading up to her murder. One headline describes her as a special school dropout, noting that Melissa had attended two schools aimed at supporting kids from dysfunctional families. Police officers who work with street youth recall Melissa as being familiar to them. There's a mention of her occasionally calling herself Lisa on the street. And I learn that prior to her murder, Melissa is interested in hairdressing. The what-ifs, the guilt... Melissa's stepmom, Linda, has been living with that for more than 30 years now. Like, I just, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. Absolutely nothing I can do about that. And she's gone. Um, so it's, it's a horrible, horrible feeling. I know that I didn't kill her, but I also didn't give her a chance to escape that life that she was in. I wanted to believe that. She was supported by a social services program and that she was working with somebody and they were going to help her through whatever difficulty she was having at home. But anyways, that's not what happened, so. Melissa is reported as missing to the Victoria Police on Friday, June 7th, 1991. One news article says it is her birth mom 
the now deceased Jenny Nicholson who makes that report. Melissa is last seen working in the Courtney and Gordon Street area in downtown Victoria, a stone's throw away from Victoria's stately Empress Hotel. A Crime Stoppers announcement later that fall mentions another report of Melissa being seen around midnight, Saturday, June 8th, making a phone call from a phone booth at Broughton and Broad Street, just a block or so away from the Victoria Stroll, where Kimberly and Sherry were last seen. The mention of that phone booth is a reminder that unlike teenage girls now, Melissa, Sherry, and Kim would not have had cell phones. Melissa's clothing that night is distinctive. Melissa is wearing aqua blue spandex tights with polka dots. She has an aqua-colored tank top and a short black jacket with tassels on the shoulders. She's wearing white high heels. There is also an unconfirmed report of her getting into a small, light-colored pickup truck late that night. And then, just days later, the following headline appears in the Victoria Times Colonist. Body identified as Teen Hooker Number 3. Teen Hooker Number 3 is 17-year-old Melissa Nicholson. On Tuesday, June 11th, Melissa's body is discovered off Stebbings Road, near the highway not far from Shawnigan Lake. That's about a 45-minute drive north of Victoria. Melissa's body is found nude, in the bushes by a man who says he was hiding his bike before hitchhiking south. Her clothing is never found. I just, I often imagine, um, you know, she would be uh, 50 this year. She would be 50 this year and she would have had grandchildren by now. Linda is unable to attend Melissa's funeral, but later she will honor Melissa's memory in a meaningful way. She visits the exact spot where Melissa's body is found. Linda puts some tobacco down. Tobacco is a big part of many Indigenous ceremonies, including those for the dead. It's often placed as an offering to the departed spirit or to the ancestors to request a safe journey to the spirit world. Not long ago, one of Linda's granddaughters travels to Victoria and tracks down Melissa's burial site. I've seen a picture of this spot. It's a tiny piece of concrete, which states simply M. Nicholson, 1991. Melissa's relative lays down some flowers and plays Led Zeppelin for Melissa. Melissa is far from forgotten by generations of her family. Every family has issues. You know, you got stuff that you got to deal with. But this scenario is just so creepily embedded into such horrific stuff. Like, it's, it's just, the more you learn, the more disturbing it is. And it's not just the dreadful circumstances of Melissa's murder that weigh on Linda today. Linda is tormented by how Melissa was portrayed in media reports at the time. I, for the very first time, I read a 17-year-old prostitute absolutely collapse. Like, I just could not believe that on top of everything else. What they're focusing on is that she's a prostitute. I just don't know how any journalist would consider that an appropriate thing to do when announcing the death of a young woman on the, whose body was thrown on the side of the road. Like, why do you, why would you do that? What, what would be the purpose to that? It just, to me, feels like we're just indicating that, you know, another Indian girl is thrown away and who cares because she's a prostitute. The unfortunate portrayal in the media, the regret of that last conversation, and the lack of information about the investigation leave Linda with a sense of unfinished business. They had a suspect, and I believe they had uh, DNA. I don't know that it's going to take away the feeling that I have. At least there would be an answer.
Melissa's surviving siblings are all living out east now, in Ontario and in New York. I'm told Melissa's brother Sean was closest to Melissa. But he's currently in jail, and it will take me some time to speak with him. But I tracked down Melissa's other brother, Chris. We set up a time to speak on the phone on a weekend morning. My name is uh, Christopher Allen Nicholson. I was born in Brooklyn, uh, Coney Island. Chris and Melissa share a birth father. They're a difficult father. He was an alcoholic. Chris tells me their father was absent most of the time and that growing up with one parent was difficult for them. Chris and Melissa have different mums, so they didn't always live in the same house. But Chris still has fond memories of his sister. She was a vibrant kid. She was a vibrant kid, and she loved going out with the family and picking berries. And more, I think more so like she loved to be outside. She was a girly girl. She loved her animals, you know, the dogs and stuff like that. She loved that. Chris is out of touch with this part of his family at the time of Melissa's murder. He will only learn about it later. He tells me it's his father and his brother, Sean, who pushed to learn answers back then. We weren't getting the results from the detectives uh, that we were looking for, so my father and my brother took uh, matters in their own hands. Chris says his father and his brother, Sean, go to Victoria and start looking for the person who killed Melissa. I don't think my father still cared about his kids. His way of caring is, uh, you know, a bit different than most fathers. You know, this is his way of, guess, I guess, finding his closure. I want to know what Chris can recall learning from his father and brother about what happened to Melissa. We knew that, uh, you know, she had been uh, streetwalking. You know, she was very young. She was uh, sexually assaulted, and then uh, she was dismembered. You know, she had been dumped. Also, and that was uh, an original thought uh, that there was a connection to a serial killer. I don't have access to Melissa's autopsy report. There is only a brief mention of an autopsy in an old article confirming Melissa died of unnatural causes. There is no mention of dismemberment or a sexual assault. I've asked the BC coroner's office to provide me with a copy of the report. My request is still being considered. In my mind, I'd imagine Melissa's family seeking answers. But Chris believes the motivation was more about settling a score. This wasn't a search for capture. This was a search for vengeance. What's the impact on the family of all of that? Well, you have to remember, you know, this is our sister. You know, the impact of her death was, you know, pretty horrific. And, you know, what they did to her was pretty horrific. And so the family was not against anything that my father or brother would have done. Then, and now, Melissa's large extended family is mostly back east. And still, after all this time, Chris shares the hurt and the anger that propelled his father and brother in their quest for revenge. You know, it's really sad that her life ended so quickly, you know, and so young. And I find it irreprehensible for a man to be able to walk this earth, you know, knowing that what they did to her. And I couldn't imagine the pain and, and suffering that she went through during the time when this monster decided he was going to take her life. I mean, I miss my sister. We talk for a time as I ask him to reach back into his memories, to sift through for any information about his sister's case. He tells me it's his understanding that there was DNA evidence. Yeah, there is some DNA, but they pinpoint the DNA uh, off my sister. Even though the 90s were early days for the technology, he wonders if there may yet be evidence that could be viable today. I'd like to see this person caught, and I'd like to be in the courtroom. I would enjoy seeing this man go to prison for life. I'd like to see him executed. I would like to grasp his life from him just the way he did it to my sister. It is the late Ken Nicholson and his son, Sean, who are on the ground here on the island, pushing for answers 30 years ago. Ken Nicholson, Melissa's dad, is long dead. And that briefcase stuffed with information about his daughter's murder is nowhere to be found. 
But I do manage to make that connection with Melissa's other brother, Sean. On the day of his sister's funeral, Sean Nicholson is taken from jail to say his goodbyes. It's also his birthday, an occasion he hasn't celebrated since. Today, 33 years later, Sean is back behind bars. We first connect via a video link. I've never really talked about it with anybody. Sean is now a middle-aged man with dark hair and glasses. He's smiling and seemingly at ease despite the circumstances. He's wearing a bright orange prison uniform, and behind him I can see other inmates gathering and milling about. Unfortunately, the audio for the link is dreadful, so our next conversation is on the phone. I can hear him much more clearly, but it's still not great. You'll need to listen closely. Well, I'm hoping that maybe the person... um Besides, like Sean's life in prison can be rough, but he's sober. He reads the Bible and his Narcotics Anonymous material. He prays and says he's just trying to do the next right thing. Like Melissa, Sean has a chaotic and troubled childhood. We talk for a time about his life in care, on the street, and the abuse he suffered as a child. Through it all, he says he finds comfort in his relationship with his sister, Melissa. Though separated by time and distance, they keep finding their way back to each other. My sister would come and visit, and I was living on the street, sleeping out of a dumpster. I would hitchhike out there to see her, you know? It's on one of these trips out to visit his little sister that Sean first notices something is off. When I went out there one time to visit her, I noticed she was different. Sean remembers his little sister owning a lot of high-heeled shoes, clothing that, to him, didn't look appropriate. He thinks Melissa is about 14 years old at this time. It seems odd to Sean. It doesn't make sense. He says he's naive back then. Sean was close to Melissa, He spent time with her not long before she's killed. And so his insights into the young woman she is growing into are helpful. Like hanging out with her friends. She was um, very outgoing. She was tough. You know what I mean? She was, oh, she, she, like, you know what I mean? She was a scrapper. Perhaps the most enduring memory Sean recalls is how Melissa seemed to want to look after people including him. She had a huge heart, man. She would help anybody. Really good people. And I never remember anybody ever saying a bad word about her. Melissa convinces her brother to move to the island, to live in Victoria so they can be close to each other. Sean's working as a carny. For a time, Melissa is too. He recalls she and her friend working at a popcorn stand. She always went out of her way for me, like, to talk to me at my level, you know what I mean? She always tried to get me to do different stuff, like, like I was always on the street stuff. She always wanted me to have a stable life. Despite the fact that Melissa was his younger sibling, she always tried to look out for her big brother. She was always different around me, like, like she was always the younger sister being the bigger sister. Sean remembers visiting her in Victoria before she's killed and meeting her then-boyfriend, who he recalls being much older than his teenage little sister. This boyfriend's name is Daryl. Sean tells me Melissa met her boyfriend Daryl when she was being sexually exploited on the street, selling sex on the Victoria Stroll. Sean says Daryl helped Melissa get away from that environment. And that's why I mean I never had a problem with the guy. You know what I mean? He was much older than her. But at least she wasn't on the street. I want to learn more about this boyfriend. It was the boyfriend. He only had one leg. It's not surprising that police will want to check him out. This older man with one leg. 
the boyfriend of a murdered teenager would be a likely suspect. Sean recalls a visit from the RCMP after his sister's death. They tell him that they have interviewed Melissa's boyfriend. Sean tries to remember what his sister's relationship is like with her boyfriend back then. I remember correct she wanted to go back to school or something like that. But they had their own apartment. They had this car that they had redone. Melissa's boyfriend has lost his leg in a motorcycle accident. Melissa has taken on his care. She basically nursed him back to life. Sean recalls a significant settlement. He was getting this big settlement. They were going to do big things. And how both Melissa and her boyfriend are into cars. It was a nice car. It was a, I think it was an Impala or something like that. It was a big Impala. It was a big car. It was a nice car. Sean learns his little sister has been murdered when a friend reads it in the paper and breaks the news to him. It falls to Sean to find their dad and tell him about Melissa. I had to find him. When I found him, I told him that uh, his daughter was was murdered. He didn't know. In those early days, Sean and his father have vengeance in their hearts. I was very much interested in the person who committed to to, um, put them where they needed to be in the ground. The desire for retribution is driven in part by a memory of seeing Melissa in her casket that to this day, Sean just can't get out of his head. It was worse than me going to my mother's funeral. They asked me ever since. I remember, I remember trying to carry her uh, casket to the the hearse. I couldn't do it. I collapsed. Sean has had more than 30 years to reflect on his sister's life and death. Today, he doesn't think Melissa was killed by someone close to her. He thinks she was killed by a serial killer. I believe Melissa was killed by a serial killer, honestly. You know what I mean? I don't believe that the person knew her. I love British Columbia, but it's a messed up place with that pig farmer and all them weird people. Sean here is referring to serial killer Robert Willie Picton. Picton is believed to be the most prolific serial killer in Canadian history. He was found guilty in 2007 of six counts of second-degree murder in the deaths of women who disappeared from Vancouver's downtown east side. Picton was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. He's suspected of killing dozens of women. The remains or DNA of 33 women were found on his farm in Port Coquitlam, around 25 kilometers east of Vancouver. Now, one of those women was Nancy Greek Clark. She also disappeared from the Victoria Stroll and happened to be friends with Melissa Nicholson. But Picton is living on the Lower Mainland, and as far as I've learned... That trip to the island at the time of Nancy Greek Clark's disappearance is unusual. Still, I make a note that I will need to check on any connections to Picton. Back then, Sean wanted vengeance. Today, he wants peace. I forgive him now. You know, it took me a lot. Are you calling? Are you reaching contact, I knew I had to forgive this guy, and I prayed for God to forgive him. You know what I mean? Because I, I can't, can't go on through life living this. I know. Police at the time are trying to see if there are connections between Melissa's case and Sherry or Kim's cases. Early in September 1991, a 12-man team was formed to investigate further. The team is made up of members from the RCMP, the Victoria Police, and the Saanich Police. Because of where the women are found, the cases fall in different jurisdictions. The RCMP for Melissa, Victoria Police for Kimberly, and Saanich Police for Sherry. The 12-man team is an effort to consolidate information and determine if they are linked. RCMP officer Len Nolan will later say there is not as strong a public interest as they had hoped, that tips are slow to come in, and the team will be disbanded.
Jasmine is the youngest of Melissa's siblings, the little sister she never had the chance to meet. My name is Jasmine Nicholson. I do have an Ungahoi name as well. My Ungahoi name is Waganiosta. It means she makes the summer beautiful. Waganiosta. Melissa Nicholson is my sister. She is a long past deceased, 32 years ago. I was seven years old when she was murdered. We share the same father, Kenneth Allen Nicholson, who is now, he, he passed away when I was 20. So a long time ago as well. And um, we live in Tynanaga, Mohawk Territory. Melissa's surviving family members have generously shared memories of their sister with me. But Melissa's youngest sister, Linda's daughter, Jasmine, well, she can't do that. I have zero memories of Melissa. And for me, growing up, the only thing I had was the stories that I get to read online. The memory that I have of my sister is that she was a prostitute. That was her legacy. So the only thing I knew is that she was beaten and strangled and thrown out of a car. As a kid, that's what I grew up knowing. And she was found naked on the side of a road. Jasmine observes that her father is consumed with the need to find out what happened to Melissa. And as she grows older, Jasmine, too, wants to learn about the big sister she never knew. But to this day, she has found very little about who her sister was in life and why and how she was killed. And as far as I knew from my father, before he had passed away, he kept a briefcase with any any insight he could possibly find. He did his own research. He talked to people, talked to people from the street. Growing up, obviously, being curious and wanting to know more, I always searched it. And I always put my name on forms so maybe someone would call or say, hey, I knew this about her or whatever, because there's nothing. When Jasmine and her family turn to the police for answers, those answers, too, are out of reach. The RCMP working then and even now, refuse to hand over any documents, any information, because it will interject on their investigation. So there is no real, there is no nothing. We know nothing. You haven't been told anything about the outcome of the investigation. Is that right? I I don't know. They told me they have 13 boxes of um, evidence that they found. As family and you're not given anything, then you don't really have much to go on. I'm the youngest out of all of my siblings on that side of my family, and I'm 40. So I will probably die just like the rest of them with no information. Because the only thing that we have is that she was a prostitute and she was murdered. And there's no healing in a family for people any at all when that is your only outcome. It was her fault. That's the outcome. That's what's told. That's the story. My whole life, it was an embarrassment. There's no good memories. Because you can't even think about writing about that stuff or talking about it or putting it up because that's what's in the media. That's all that's there. She was a prostitute. And ultimately, I don't have memories of her. So the only thing I have is that. So I was robbed of all of those pieces. A few years back, Jasmine and her brother Seth meet with the RCMP. They are hoping they will finally get some answers about what happened to Melissa. When they were doing the inquiry process on murder to missing Indigenous women, two RCMP officers flew in from Vancouver to sit and speak to me and my brother. So we went to Toronto and they handed me a package and gave me all the articles that were in the news at the time. And when we asked about getting a copy of her autopsy, we were told, no, we can't, because it would hinder the investigation. It didn't matter what we asked, they couldn't tell us. I'm sorry, that's a part of the investigation. Sorry, that's a part of the investigation. The only thing that I was told was that there was an investigation around her boyfriend. Jasmine has come to the meeting with a goal. She wants answers about her sister's death. And the police, it would seem, have also come with an agenda. 
They ask Melissa's family to make a video plea to the son of a man who is a suspect in her sister's murder. This request to Melissa's family to make a plea to the relative of a deceased suspect tells me a couple of things. The RCMP have DNA evidence in Melissa's case. At some point, they have a suspect who is now deceased. But still, there are no answers, and the weight of Melissa's murder lies heavily with Jasmine and the rest of her family. Jasmine shares a perspective I've not heard before. She wants the RCMP to close her sister's case. You know, her father and her mother are both gone. Besides trying to hide or being embarrassed that this was what is stated about your family members or who you are, you know, how could your family be so broken? And how would you possibly have a sister that was like that? Because there's that shame base that comes with it. And for me, that's why I would just like to end it. If you haven't found it now, then just end it so we can put her to rest. I would like Melissa's death to be just put to rest. And that's the way I felt when I met with the RCMP, when I asked them to close it, shut it off, close it, give me the information, I don't need you to investigate it anymore, put it away. You can hand the boxes over, it's over. But Canada doesn't work like that. I asked Jasmine to reflect on how Melissa's death has impacted her family. My mother carries a lot of shame and sadness because she didn't take her on, which impacted on us, obviously, growing up, the resentment and guilt. My father never stopped looking. He never, ever stopped looking. There's no closure. I know I'm very guarded, personally, in my own home. I don't let people come here. I live a very isolated life because it's over protection. I know that. And I'm assuming that's partly where it comes from. I don't trust people. Can't trust people. There's probably way more things, but for me, the ones that stand out the most is just being um, embarrassed and sad that that's the truth of who she was. My dad was so consumed by her death that that's, that's all he talked about. And as for my brothers, my two older brothers don't talk about, they will completely shut off the conversation. It is not a conversation you have with them. It's like she didn't exist. It's easier that way. I do know that my brother Sean really did take responsibility. He feels like he failed and it destroyed his life. Like her brothers, Jasmine wonders if her sister's life was taken by a serial killer. I've thought about all of those things. Is there a connection not only with these women that have gone missing, in the same areas. I think I remember, what was it, Nancy Creek? That was one of the women that was, they were trying to connect. My dad had told me before that they did suspect there was two different serial killers. Picton was one of them. Nancy Creek, or Nancy Creek Clark, was a friend of Melissa's. Nancy goes missing just months after Melissa's death. Her DNA will be found years later on Picton's farm. It's horrific to contemplate that more than one serial killer was active at the time Melissa, Kim, and Sherry are being exploited in downtown Victoria. Jasmine shares a hope that even if Melissa's killer is never brought to justice, that her sister's memory, her legacy, can be lifted up. I still love a person that I don't even know, and I hope you do find things out, and I hope that maybe... You will be the the catalyst that can help some of these families get... I don't want to use the, the word justice. I want to use the word peace. Sherry, Melissa, and Kimberly are all being trafficked in downtown Victoria before their murders. It's the place they were working on the night they were killed. And I'm beginning to believe it was a hunting ground for a serial killer. I'm headed back in time to the Victoria Stroll in 1990. That's next in episode four. 
Street was where a lot of the fairly expensive shops were. But as soon as the shops closed, that became the stroll. And the girls would stand on the stroll and pick up tricks. The prostitutes themselves generally were mainly young female. On the down and outs, a lot of them were drug addicted. Uh, so you would see young women standing on the street in high traffic areas where the public was, and it was obvious why they were there. I'm Laura Palmer, and this is Island Crime Season 6, Sweethearts. If you, or someone you know, may be a human trafficking victim, call the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-833-900-1010. The hotline is a confidential, multilingual service. It operates 24-7 to connect victims and survivors with social services, law enforcement, and emergency services. It also receives tips from the public. 1-833-900-1010. 